think I actually am in love with New York City. Everything I breathe is Queens. Um, I think we are the most exquisite borough out here. I am 39 years old. I built multiple business in New York City. Um, I started in childcare because my son is autistic and I couldn't find proper childcare for him. Uh, with that, I've seen such, it's been a hard road with that. I've seen such a lack of resources in our neighborhoods and I decided to build upon that and bring those resources to us. Then I started my group home. I'm like, okay, if my son isn't able to take care of himself, where do, where do they go? And with that, there's still a lack. I still, people call me every day, Nicole, can you help me? My son needs services. Oh, Nicole, can you help me get started for a business? Oh, can you help me? And I'm like pulling myself from left to right just to try to help these people. And I'm lacking resources. I'm losing sleep. I'm sleeping four hours a day trying to help somebody else. So I said, you know what? You have the know-how. You have some money. You have the knowledge. You have the heart. What are you lacking? Power. I felt that I was lacking power. And in order for me to get power, I decided to run for city council. If you have that confidence in yourself and if you build yourself up, regardless of where you come from, there's so many lessons I've learned from people younger than me, older than me. And then I even tell friends of mine, like you're so smart and you're so capable, but you don't believe in yourself. So if you don't exude that, how am I gonna believe in you? How can you sell me? With that confidence had led me this far. We are like no, no other, like nobody else has the ambition and the drive like a, a New Yorker. I actually learned about Citizens NYC through a friend of mine. Uh, she started a little program, a mentoring program for little girls. And I was like, okay, well, I need some grants for, for my businesses. How do I start that? Once I tried and filled the application out, um, everybody seemed very helpful. I actually was awarded two grants in one year. And I was so excited. I was like, oh. You guys helped me grow in such an amazing way. And I'm, I'm just happy to have you guys with me. With that unity together, we can make miracles happen. I believe that our communities need a renegade revolutionist like me. Be a New Yorker for New York and donate today. Wow, how inspiring. Welcome, everyone. It is Thursday, February 25th. Uh, we're so happy that you can be here for our Citizens NYC Live Rethink and Rebuild discussion today. Uh, we're really excited for today's discussion. Uh, we'll actually be continuing a conversation that we had back in December about hyperlocal potting. This is part two. Uh, so we'll be discussing community in action as it relates to education. So thank you so much for being here. Um, today is a really special day for the organization uh, because at the close of Black History Month, it, which also happens to be the start of Women's History Month uh, a few days early, we are launching the New Yorkers for New York fundraising campaign today. So we're honoring five extraordinary women who are working to rethink, rebuild, and reimagine New York City. So that's that video that you saw uh, at the top of the show. So this is a, a new innovative take on fundraising during COVID, and it will feature virtual storytelling series, focus on women's rights, entrepreneurship, uh, immigrant heritage, and commitment to diversity. So starting today, Every gift received will be matched one to one uh, up to $150,000. We have a new website for this campaign actually, uh, where you can learn more about our honorees and donate. All you have to do is click that QR code that you see on the screen and you'll get full access to our brand new site. Or you can go to citizensnyclive.org slash New Yorkers. So we're excited to present our first honoree today for our Rethink and Rebuild discussion, Nicole Lee. Nicole Lee is a community advocate. She's an entrepreneur. Uh, she's a candidate for the New York City Council. Uh, she is a Citizens NYC grantee partner with more than a decade of experience. 
managing small businesses, uh, serving as the founder of Mother Goose Daycare, uh, Wink Beauty Parlor, and Journey Through Seth's Eyes, which provides a safe environment and resources for children with special needs, all in her neighborhood of Rockaway, Queens. Nicole truly is the future. Welcome, Nicole. Hi, thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit uh, about what it means to be an honoree this year. You are our first honoree and you're also uh, our, our only grantee partner to be lifted up. So tell us a little bit about you know how you felt when you heard the news. I was super excited and honored to be given this award. It just means a lot and that the work I've been doing is being noticed. And uh, I'm just grateful to have this experience with you guys. I was like, oh, okay, I'm so excited for it. And it's like right on time, like extra motivation, extra push. Because sometimes, you know, working in the community, you know, entrepreneur, you can get, you know, faced with so much adversity and you can get overwhelmed at times. So sometimes you need that extra push and excitement. So I was grateful to have it. It's just like literally right on time with everything that I'm going through now with the whole campaign and rebuilding the businesses with COVID. I was just super excited to just be a part of this. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. Awesome. We're so excited to honor you, Nicole. And um, for folks that are watching, can you tell us a little bit about your neighborhood? You know, we're really big on neighborhood community leaders. So uh, tell us a little bit about Rockaway Queens and um, what's going on in your neighborhood right about now. Okay. So I'm from Far Rockaway, born and raised. I'm 39 years old. Um, actually, our neighborhood is facing tremendous shutdowns we're just rebuilding with the whole covid they just opened kept to uh, nyc dining so the whole restaurant business is trying to get more uh i guess more business um our school systems are still suffering with lack of services and resources uh i'm a big special needs advocate because my son is autistic uh still getting those services in our area has been very hard thus far, uh, even before COVID, especially during COVID at these times, a lot of children have lack of resources. The digital divide, they don't have devices to actually go online. Some people are suffering uh, with online services. Uh, they don't have the access to it or they are, they're not equipped with uh, that type of learning. So that's a part of it. The whole division with the race war that we've been going on with the Black Lives Matter movement, that's another thing. Um, it's getting a little better, but it's, it's, it's quiet. Now it's getting back to before where it's just quiet racism versus loud racism when uh, Trump was in office. That's another thing that we're facing. Uh, the whole city council campaign, I was in a special election, that's going on now. The whole uh, dynamic is changing in Rockaway, Queens. They're rebuilding. They have a lot of homeless services here also. Uh, we just need to really rebuild this community on, on so many levels. So that's some of the things that we're facing in the Rockaways. So you, you spoke about education resources a little bit, and, and that's the main topic for today. So we'd love to get a better sense of what resources you do have access to right now in your community. And just as a, as a New York City mother, um, but yeah, we'd love to get your take on what resources you do have access to, um, and then also how grassroots groups can tap into um, you know, these resources as a part of the broader fabric of New York City. Mm -hmm. So I am a mother of three kids, three different ages and uh, spectrums in the school system. So I have a son who's in private school, he's autistic, and then I have a 15-year-old daughter, she goes to a charter school, and then I have a six-year-old daughter who goes to a regular public DOE school. So all three different schools have different processes and different <laughs> resources. Fortunately, uh, my son is out of this district that I live in. He goes to school in Forest Hills because that was the best uh, school for him to get him services. Um, with that, the other two, my other two daughters go to school in the Rockaways. The charter school, uh, they have more freedom with the curriculum, um, but I still think they lack resources and funding. Uh, my daughter's DOE school is actually doing really well. The elementary schools in Rockaway are great. They still need more uh, innovative resources in reference to programming to our school system, like coding. I really feel that with COVID, it showed us where we fell and we're really behind. Our children are really suffering with that. Um, my son is autistic. I have other special needs advocate parents that I work with. Their kids don't have... Uh, 
resources to the speech programs that's here, uh, the OT therapist that's coming. They're not really coming out to see the kids. We don't. We have such a digital divide, like I said before, we don't have access to computers. We need more computers, we need more programming. Second language is another thing that we're lacking. Um, it's, it's so much, I can just like go, oh, actually even, when they have extracurricular activities, we don't have that anymore. That's a lack of funding in that area. Water safety, we're on the beach. We don't have any pools anymore in our school system. Water safety is not a part of the school district on the Rockers when we live in the water. That's another big thing that we're lacking. Um, so as a mother, I kind of fight to bring all of these resources back to our neighborhoods. And I've been doing that for over 10 years. And it's really been hard because um, sometimes you feel like you're fighting alone. But then when you have other people with you, there's a power in numbers. We can really try to get some movement and traction. And that's what we've been doing thus far. So even with that, we're fighting with the big heads in DOE, trying to get more resources here. We're also collaborating with a lot of nonprofits to give back. And that's what I've been doing with schools in my area. I've been giving back with my nonprofit, with you guys' help, with the grant money that I've received, you're able to gain resources and education to these parents and these kids. Uh, so that's one of the things I'm trying to focus on now to help actually get free help from other organizations so these parents don't have the financial strain and or also the schools as well to to mm -hmm. get the help that they need so um that's part of it. it it's really been a tough road but i'm here for the ride and um i'm just excited just to be a part of the the movement in the process you know mm -hmm. So that's some of the stuff that that we're lacking in this area. It's when you when I look at my children, I just get motivated. Like my son is the reason why I started everything that I'm doing thus far. Uh, mm -hmm. Just the looking in his eyes and seeing what the future holds for him and what wasn't here. I had to create that. And that's what I think that we have to do as a whole as grassroots organizations. We are recreating the will. We have to keep it moving, you know, what's what's lacking. If we don't have it here, let's go get it. And if they don't have it, let's build it. And that's what we've been doing thus far for the past 10 years. And we still have some work to do because people are still naive to special education and to the lack of the system. Uh, mm -hmm. You just have to recreate the system now. And I think that people are now, I'm hopeful that people are getting excited about that and, and educated about doing it and making their voices heard that's my been my main thing is your voice is powerful and there's a power in numbers so that's just been my experience i hope i didn't talk too long <laughs> no that's great no that's great you know i'm interested to know what you feel like has been working when profits and grassroots organizations do step in you know what roles are they filling and then two you know where are there opportunities for grassroots groups to take a look at education and really think about um, ways for them to help fill in some gaps? So I think that the grassroots organizations actually, like I said, help with the financial strain of the school systems and some of the some of the parents that they can't afford to pay for some of these programs that they need. They say everything about the budget. The budget is short. They don't have enough money. So I think that implementing nonprofits and grassroots organizations will help with that, fill it in the gap. And then they also have DOE contractors that if you are a nonprofit or a, a New York contractor, they call you, you can get funding from the DOE to pay for some of your service, which will help your nonprofit as well. So that's another loophole in the system that we've been trying to learn. But I think if we put those two loopholes together, we can create a different division for education that doesn't really have to go within the DOE or education school system budget. So I think that's a big thing that I'm trying to look at and see how we can recreate that for entrepreneurs, nonprofits to bring more programming into our school systems. Like I said, I feel like we're so behind as a culture that um, look at China. They're so innovative with technology. Our kids are behind on that. And we need to implement that stuff into our school system, electrician programs, coding programs, second language programs. It's just a lot that we're lacking that I think that with nonprofit helps that we can make such movement. But you have to be open minded and you actually literally have to lay out the plan for people to to play you understand so um that's what i think that with the two combined together uh we can create a maybe a new school system who knows you know they might need that <laughs> we might have to call a grassroots school system but uh they have charter schools why that can't be an option so that's basically what i'm trying to do now is just bring everybody together that uh, like everybody who really wants to make a difference in the community see how we can do that with uh without the funding from the city so 
that's just my take on it. <laughs> yeah. And maybe we can do that together with citizens. Who knows? Like we have so many ideas. You guys have helped me branch off into so many different spectrums of my career. I'm just like excited. And every time I talk with any one of you guys, I just feel like an extra motivation. Like, so maybe I'll start that. You never know. <laughs> well, we're, we're so proud of you, Nicole. And the work that you're doing truly matters in the community. So to see your passion, to hear your ideas um, is, is a joy. So um, we'll, we'll come back to you for the Q&A. So I may have some follow-up questions for you. Um, no but thank you so much for kicking us off. Thank you. All right, next up we have Alexis Lavarez. Uh, speaking of folks in the community who are helping to fill the gap, you know, Alexis has become a little famous on TikTok, so you may recognize him. Um, but, you know, he's really doing the work as, as a member of the youth to help educate folks in this new virtual world that we live in. So, welcome, Alexis. Thank you for being here. Hi. So, so tell folks a little bit about, you know, what it's been like being a student during the pandemic for you? Um, I feel like being, uh, like when it comes to like um, the pandemic, the online school has been like difficult for us, but I feel like it's time where we need to like persevere and like, go, you know, go through these challenges. I feel like this is like a way for us, like, you know, whether like if we're doing online or like in school, we're, we're always trying to persevere through this and we're trying to just get our education. Yeah. No, definitely. So, so what was the inspiration, you know, with so much changes going on, what was your inspiration to start tutoring on TikTok? Did you see that there was a need for that or is it an outlet for you? Um, how did that come about? So initially, like I was a teacher assistant for my school, the democracy prep. And ever since they gave me the opportunity to become a teacher assistant, I felt the need that like, I wanted to share my knowledge to like, you know, like a bigger audience, like, you know, in the New York, in New York City um, community. But um, like through the platform on TikTok, I was able to, you know, like not only like uh, specifically like help people in that area, but multiple, multiple people in the world. So like, I feel like with this um, platform, it gave me the, you know, the base where I could like share my SET videos, where I could share my math videos to hundreds of thousands of people and they could use my videos to their advantage when it comes to like, you know, acing like another test or any like, you know, like science quiz or like any type of educational like problems that they need to solve. So I, um, I'm i really grateful because like, yeah, my school, my school is like one of the reasons why like I started like, you know, making these videos because they have like this mission where like we want to become active citizenships, acting citizens. And um, when it comes to me, like I really want to bring back to the community of what I learned in my school and just give it out to like other people. Yeah, no, I mean, good for you. And we need more folks in the community like you to be doing this kind of work. You know, I, I'm interested to know whether how students are responding to the work that you're doing, whether they've find that doing the work on TikTok or learning in that way is easier for them um, or, you know, if it gets them engaged, what, what's been your feedback? What's the feedback you're getting from folks? Yeah. Um, thank you. So um, basically like on TikTok, the way how it works is that like I do like a one minute video and it depends on like what video I make. So like it could be like an SET video, an Algebra 1 video, like any like topic within that subject of math and STEM um, related. And basically like the videos will be like just that question. But then there's also other platforms that I use like Google Classrooms where like there's like 30,000 students, also Discord as well, where there's like numerous numerous of like, you know, multiple like um, students who collectively like, you know, help each other out. So it's not like only like I am helping now, but also like as, as much people as they want, like that they want to join the, the platforms, they could all help each other out. And the feedback that I've been receiving is like, you know, positive, like they really enjoyed the fact that like, I'm over here, like, you know, making this um, a place where people can get their education. And regardless of like where they are in the education, they could always receive help that they need. Do you see yourself, you know, continuing this on after the pandemic or, you know, what are your thoughts about the success that, that this has garnered? So I started TikTok before the pandemic, but um, I will always want to continue this because this is something that like brings me positive like um, vibes, like where like 
it's something that like I'm doing this because like it, it makes me happy to do where where like I like lo- I love to like help my community out and like I said like it evol- it all evolves in my school like um my school is also like a community so like I feel like because of my school because of like the person who I am like I just like love to bring back to my community whether that's like you know the education that I get I just want to like give it out to people as much as I can. That's a great mentality to have. It truly is. Um, so um, you are a junior, is that right? Or I'm a senior in, senior. in high school. Have you decided what college you want to go to yet? Or no, I'm getting decisions soon. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. Well, good luck with that. I, I'm interested to know for folks that are younger than you or even you know, um, students who are just interested in doing s- similar work or similar projects, you know, what kind of advice would you give to students, you know, no matter the age, if they're interested in starting their own project? Well, regardless of any project, I feel like knowing that like anything is possible, like you need to like know that mindset that like, as long as you try something, like it will give you a result. And I feel like for me, like I came out of like, you know, like in this platform where like I had like I didn't have like the mindset that I wasn't like, you know, blow up. I just like tried it because I just wanted to help people out. And so like just the mindset that you have, which is like to help people out, as long as you have that mindset and you keep pushing yourself to, you know, um, make this content or like anything, anything like you want for your project, as long as you try, results will happen and then you will go on from there. What's next for you, Alexis? Um, well, I'm currently like, you know, like where, where I said like about the Discord, well, basically, like, I really want the Discord to be, like, a um, a school setting where, like, you know, we will have, like, daily, like, you know, math questions, daily, um, you know, sessions with, like, you know, voice channels. Like, I feel like with um, Discord and also, like, having, like, a proper, like, you know, like, teaching um, way, I feel like that's something that I really want to push in the future because um, I really didn't see this, like, as a thing that I would do, but because of, like, you know, the amount of things that I've been doing, like it's making me really like, it's a passion that I really like to enjoy to do. So in the, in the future, I would love to like probably like have my, my, my own, you know, organization where like, I would like, you know, offer these, you know, um, resources and all these things that I could offer all, all students around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. That's great. You know, it's funny if, if, mentioning a project, uh, if you want to carry out your own community project, you should definitely apply to our All in Neighborhood grant. Um, But just for folks that are also watching and listening, you know, we're awarding up to $10,000 to grassroots community organizations right now. And so if you just record that link at the bottom, it should pop up too on Facebook in the comments. Um, All you have to do is go to citizensnyc.org slash grant making um, to check out the application. And this application is actually on a rolling basis. So we encourage folks to apply early, apply soon, apply today um, if you can. Uh, So thank you, Alexis. Any last words? Um, No, but just for all students out there, as long as you try, you will get you will get results. So yeah, just try. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, and good luck with everything as you prepare for college. Thank you. All right, folks. Well, if you are just tuning in, welcome. Again, today is a special day for Citizens NYC because we're launching the New Yorkers for New York campaign. Nicole Lee is our first honoree. She was the guest that joined us at the top of the show. Uh, And the New Yorkers for New York campaign is a virtual fundraising campaign. We're honoring five extraordinary women from NYC uh, who are all working to rethink, rebuild, and reimagine New York City. Uh, Our goal is to raise $1.5 million for this campaign for this year so that we can help New Yorkers get back on their feet. All you've got to do is use that QR code that just popped up on the screen, uh, or you can go to citizensnyc.org slash New Yorkers to get full access to our brand new site and to find out how you can donate. Okay, next up we have a lovely panel. So this again is a continuation of the conversation that we had here uh, back in December. So we have Rebecca Garte and Cheyenne uh, Sanchez welcoming uh, or joining us. Thank you so much both to you, welcome. We've got Rebecca. Hi. 
Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Um, Cheyenne may call me <laughs> if her connection doesn't allow her to join. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, no worries. No worries. See what happens with her. <laughs> Okay. Well, well. just to give an intro, Rebecca and Cheyenne uh, have used the New York City Education Community Resource Map to connect with one another and to start a hyper-local potting initiative in the Bronx. So we're excited to say that this tool is now available on our website for our partners to use as well. Um, all you have to do is go to the resource page on our website. Uh, it just popped up below. It's citizensnyc.org slash resources. And uh, Rebecca, as we're we're looking to get Cheyenne on, maybe can you tell us a little bit about the resource map and what your experience has been like? You know, working with one another. Yeah. So um, I got in touch with Rasan in the summer to discuss ways that the students who are in a teacher training program, where I'm a professor, could possibly connect with uh, nonprofits that I know. You know, I know that you citizens has a large database of grantees that are nonprofits. And so we are trying to find a way that our students can get their field work, their student teaching experience with children without having to um, be at any risk, you know, through COVID. Okay. So this was where we sort of came up with this initial possibility. And then I um, sent the data about our students to citizens so that they could, you know, impute them into the data map. And so now you're able, we're able to look through where all the orgs are and match them up with where our students are concentrated, where they live. So Amaya's Book Reads um, was one of the first organizations that looked really exciting. Uh, we have, they have two locations. Um, one in Inwood, one in the South Bronx, where we have high concentrations of students. So many of our students live in those areas. So the idea was to try to connect students with orgs where they were in their local community and they wouldn't have to use public transportation or put themselves at risk in any way. Awesome. And so, um, you know, uh, Cheyenne and I were talking about um, the questions that you have for us. And we were both talking about the importance of relationship building and very grassroots forms of outreach. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, using the map, uh, I'm just wondering if she's going to pop up anytime, but I guess not. using the map, um, you know, I looked up her org, the, the website was there. It looked amazing. I called the phone number, not realizing that that was actually her personal cell phone and, you know, didn't get an answer. And then I was like, let me try again. And I called back and she answered. Awesome. <laughs> and the point that I'm making with that little story is that um, these kinds of partnerships really require that type of communication. It can't really be done by email or, you know, in a, in a distant way, it really has to be in person so that people can establish trust. And um, Cheyenne has shared with me as well that her work with her organization is similar in that way because she has spent a tremendous amount of her work um, building relationships through very grassroots outreach. And she's described to me how she has gone to public schools, knocked on doors, um, you know, made connections with whoever the gatekeeper is. Sometimes it's, you know, the security officer or the, the school secretary. And so by doing that, by being in the community and persistent in trying to build connections, she's been able to have those connections for her organization, which is where her families come from. So we sort of have a similar, we've had an ex a similar process in terms of having to, um, needing to have very uh, grassroots types of outreach. And what's happened with some of the other orgs on the map is that, you know, that's not possible because of COVID. And so we haven't been able to have as many of the connections that I was hoping. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Amaya's Book Reads has a website. 
Cheyenne is very responsive, but not everybody is able to do that, especially during this time. Mm -hmm. So I think as far as using the map, um, you know, it's a great, it's an amazing tool, especially for, for us because it has our specific students. Um, but ultimately it's just the very first step of a tool. And what really needs to happen is for people to be able to be in the neighborhoods and really be very local in their connections in order to, to build something. So you mentioned, you know, that you like to get the word out and connect with folks that are in the community. So how have you been able to, uh, I know you said it's difficult to do that, but get the word out right now um, so that folks that do need this resource um, are able to to tap into what you guys have to offer. I mean, for my, myself specifically, I'm focused on my students. Okay. Um, so I also have another connection with another org called T Together We Can in Corona, Queens. We have a large number of students in, living in Corona, Queens. So we've actually partnered with them and we are creating a new program <laughs> for just based on two of our students. Um, in that case, one of their staff or directors explained how she's on a WhatsApp chat with families that they serve. And she simply, you know, sent out an, a text saying who would like to have support from you know, student teachers for their children. And she said she was just flooded with responses. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, it's really, so obviously I can't, I mean, that's not part of what I do, but um, I think if there are organizations out there that would like to have connections with student teachers, people who are studying to become teachers, um, they can you know, we're, we're easy to reach. <laughs> we're, we're a college, but getting connected up with people in the community when there's COVID and people are not sure exactly um, how to connect uh, is a little bit challenging. Typically our students do all of their field work and student teaching in classroom settings. So that is what people usually think about when they think about student teaching and we're not able to send our students into classrooms. So there are many orgs on there that are Head Starts and public schools. And unfortunately we can't work with them until you know, we're given the green light basically. Um, well, I love, so, the example. I love the example you just gave about uh, just texting your community. I mean, that is yeah. grassroots in its truest form is just reaching out to the people that you know um, after hearing about a resource and uh, word of mouth. So, you know, it's good to hear that that did work and and could continue to work. Um, so that that's a great example that you shared. Yeah, I think that for the organizations um, who are you know up and running, you know, we're we're here, <laughs> so they can they can get in touch with us, but. Yeah, it's it's a little, you have to be very, I assume, you know, very tuned in to how people are communicating with one another. And that has changed. And all of the in-person outreach that people have always done is a little bit, um, you know, has changed. And so trying to find your place in this world, especially for a nonprofit, I imagine um, is challenging. And there may be a little bit of a lack in that, but I think Cheyenne is gonna call me okay. so that she can be on speaker. <laughs> this is how connected we, we've gotten. Um, okay, go for it. <laughs> go for it, Cheyenne. I just wanna say one thing while we're waiting for her that your first guest, um, Nicole spoke to, because I think it's really important since I have this platform um, regarding education. We really need to look at the lack of budgetary investment at the state and city level in public education, both K through 12 as well as CUNY. Because as Nicole mentioned, we have pre-existing, you know, lack of resources anyway, but now in order to reopen, we need actually twice the teachers. Mm -hmm. So until we start getting reinvestment and and like a much stronger degree of investment that mm -hmm. will not happen 
So um, as far as local politicians and parent activists and advocacy groups, we really need to push that because that money has not has been diverted away from education and it needs to be brought back in as well as added. No, I appreciate that commentary. And I think we we should uh, revisit that in the Q&A. Um, but I, I would like to know before you try to bring Cheyenne and, uh, you know, what a, about potting, like what is necessary in order for potting to be successful from your experience? What are, what are some of the key, um, yeah, what, what, what's important to keep in mind in order to, to have a successful potting experience? So I don't have any personal experience with potting, but um, based on, you know, my experience with people and children, I will say that um, if you want to have a pod where nobody is getting paid and it is a mutual aid type of pod, then there has to be a lot of mutual trust and mutual responsibility. Um, yeah, mutual responsibility, reciprocity, and there has to be a lot of relationship building. So I would say the model that both Cheyenne and Together We Can have are that they have personal relationships with the people who they're working with. And they serve as a connector and a gatekeeper, not so much a, gate, a gatekeeper who has the gate open. Right. So they are using their social capital, their, um, you know, their education, their knowledge of their communities, as well as the, you know, other orgs and educational institutions to make to be that that center of connectedness for families. And that is what is needed. And, you know, we don't I mean, schools were that right. And now we're kind of losing that a little bit. So I agree with Nicole as well that there's a space to pull in um, nonprofits. Although I would also argue that there should be public funding for that as well, <laughs> because it, it's not fair to leave that up to the to the private or nonprofit sector. I don't think that that won't lead to equity in the long term. I'm wondering if we could get Cheyenne. Um... Where's Cheyenne? <laughs> Can you talk, Cheyenne? Well, you know, we can hear it. We can hear. Yeah, I think Cheyenne, it would just be good. <laughs> this is this is great. Cheyenne, it this is great. Great. <laughs> So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Catalyst, Dr. Harris, Paige, Rebecca, thank you so much for that introduction. Katie, D, scholars, thank you so much for the sad breath and an audience. I would definitely like to thank um, the Citizens Committee for your continuous support and this platform to definitely be able to give out awareness on grassroots and communities and equitable parties. My name is Cheyenne Sanchez. And thanks for anyone that does not know, you can see it, I guess, in the base. I am founder and CEO of Alliance for Peace Inc., which is a youth and family literacy and wellness nonprofit organization committed to empowering, engaging, and offering the value of literacy and wellness for youth and families in underprivileged communities. Today, I'm going to be addressing, you know, hyper-local education and panel discussion in of course, low-income communities like Highbridge, which we are working in, and also in within that time. Uh, I kind of wanted to do a little overview on, from the community perspective, on how we experience the connection with teachers and youth, even before COVID. <laughs> so this is not even during COVID. Before COVID, it was a bit challenging. We do you know it takes a village to support and to help um, community members to be able to succeed in low-income areas. So doing community members, they do spread out the community. We did know before we used to use word of mouth, we would, you know, post flyers and things like that. Thank you, God, nowadays we just have the digital areas of we have, you know, platforms like Citizens Committee, we have platforms of social media, we have platforms like websites, and also community partnerships. I kind of became a little coordinator at a community partnership program. For children in Highbridge, uh, basically they're a community partnership that houses, you know, referrals, they do anything, you know, to kind of connect, being that bridge in the gap of community members, agencies, 
and also schools, et cetera. Um, this was a very fortunate thing, which I did not even think about it until now. Uh, we created the Family Literacy Program together, and where I became the literacy coordinator, and we kind of got some funding from the ATS and the ICT Trophy Fund as well. Uh, there, I kind of made a for us. I made a created a binder. It was not even a database. It was a binder where I physically, you know, printed out and got all the information from the local schools, the local daycares, the local shelters, any um, agencies of the, uh, religious affiliation and merchants of locally on the community. I found out a very good ecology of the community to be able to know how to service our members and how to reach them. I did, with having that at hand, it was easier to kind of contact principal, PTA, and any community in the school. However, the calling and email was not successful. I would call, these messages, voicemails, I'm trying to talk to the principal to bring this great opportunity. Um, of this program for free for the school to benefit students. All the school has to do was give capacity and a space. It was for something like that that you would think anybody would be so quick to get us to it. It took a while to get to it. It was not until I did notice that I got up and I directly went with my papers in hand and I went directly to the school face to face to request this meeting. And hey, something that was really, really insane was that Actually, it did work. I got the meeting. After all these emails and, and phone calls and voice emails that I did, did not, was not successful, I did notice that I had to go in person and make that interpersonal connection with the school in order to get this done. And yes, it worked very well because we did do a successful, we ran a great successful program. We impacted 350 families. Thank you. I don't want to stop it because it, it's good it's good it's Oh, Cheyenne, Cheyenne, just wait one minute. I think uh, Paige has something to add. Yeah, I just want to say um, this is good information, so I didn't want to stop her. It's good for folks to see, like, this is true grassroots in action, um, but it's a little muffled. So I think it's best for us to share her information in the comments. Um, and then, um, you know, we can follow up if, if there's anything additional that you'd like for the audience to know. Thank you, Cheyenne. <laughs> Cheyenne? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, I think the sound is uh, not going so well. So they're going to send it um, for the Q&A. I think it was helpful, though, to just hear her say, you know, you have to show up in person. Um, and really, you know, be willing to be connected to the people. So um, that's what I got out of it. And just, you know, attempts via email didn't necessarily work uh, all the time. And so really just being grassroots and, and being true to um, being in the community is what I picked up from that. So we'll share your information in the chat, Cheyenne. Thank you so much for that. I wanted to give you that space. Um, okay, let's move on to our Q&A. Um, you know, we are really excited to dive into some of the details of what we discussed today. So my colleague D, welcome D. Uh, D will be facilitating our Q&A today. Um, we should, I think we should have Nicole back on as well. Um, and Alexis, I don't think is participating. So welcome D. Hi. Uh Hi everyone for tuning in for, thank you for tuning in for this show. It was great conversation going on. Um, so my name is Dee, I work for Citizens NYC and I'll be moderating today's Q&A section. So kind of to continue our great conversation that we just heard from Rebecca and Cheyenne on the film, uh, I wonder if you could give any tips for parents, teachers and students who would like to join a pod or start a potting project. We just heard that interpersonal connection is key. If there are any other takeaways and tips, and also Nicole, feel free to jump in as here we have an expert in-house who does experience a potting project. So if there's anything that you think that parents or students would like to know, also feel free to share them here as well. Okay. Oh, uh, I, as far as joining a pod, um, I'm not, you know, as I said, that's not really something I'm a part of, but um, I do know that there is a, um, 
I can maybe send the information out, but there is a movement for um, people of color to start pods and it's uh, national. And the idea behind it is to question and challenge some of the ways that education works um, for you know various different kinds of families. I think uh, with Nicole's description of the lack of resources for children with special needs, that is one issue. Another issue is the way that systemic racism, unfortunately, often plays out in classrooms and schools. And so that is a movement that I'm aware of. I am not part of it, but I do know about it and I support it. Um, you know, I also think that there's this idea of connecting to local hyper local resources in terms of community centers and nonprofits. But again, there's so many challenges with COVID. Um, it's, it used to be, there used to be a way that pe parents could have conversations in the playground. Um, I've done some community work that involved walking up to parents and giving them a flyer and having a conversation. Um, those things are sort of cut off a little bit now. Um, but I, I guess I would say if you're a parent who is struggling, um, which I think all of us are, um, find someone else to, to talk to about it. You know, don't isolate yourself. Even if that person is a neighbor, um, the more people you speak to, the more likely you are to connect and really, um, build some power, which I think Nicole had also mentioned. So, uh, as far as educators, um, that's a whole other side. I, <laughs> I'm not, I, I, I don't know what to say about that regarding potting. Educators are trying to balance, you know, many different demands, including working with their own children. Um, so talking, communication, relationship building, trust building, local power building, those would be the, the keys for everybody, I think. Great, thanks for that, kind of that high Go ahead. I, I, I had to switch from my phone to my computer so I hope you guys can hear me. I just feel like why do we have to create so many different aspects for education? Like why do we have to create pods? Why can't we just put that money into our school systems and all those ideas incorporate it into our school systems? That's the problem that we're having thus far in New York City overall, not just in my area, but in everyone else's area. Everybody's creating charter schools and other school and private schools because our regular public schools do not have what we need. So therefore we need to hold everybody accountable or your local politicians accountable you need to get on your school boards and your community boards and really make a difference in your community everybody wants to complain don't get the work done you have in order to get the work done you have to come together you have to voice your your problems and then you have to find solutions for those problems it's not you can't have hand that to somebody else and that's the problem what we have thus far i am a true person in my community in and out of my community Community. Anything that I see that I think I need, if, if they don't have it, I'm going to create it. And if not, that's why I'm running for office, to create those needs that we see, that they need already, that's lacking for so many years. So you have part of the system on the sideline when you live here and you say, oh, well, we don't have this. So what I'm going to look at the digital divide now. I'm in Rockaway and my connection is crazy. You know, it's on and off, it's in and out. And that's ridiculous. We are 2021 now. So it's like, okay, oh, I shouldn't have to go outside of Rockaway to put my son in schools to give him a better education. We should have that education here in our local schools. We should have to pay for private schools. We should have to allocate money for different types of schools or pods. And we should fight for us and complain and get the work done. That's the, that's the only thing I really have to say about that. I'm just sick of everybody saying, oh, we need this, we need that. So if you think that we need it, then how about we get together and get it done? Write letters, make phone calls, do a protest. There's so many ways you can make a movement just for free, just by coming together. So I just think that everyone wants to have outside entities and we really need to look on inward and how we can create that in our own communities with grassroots or even our regular public school systems. That's how I kind of want to chime in on that. Yes. Yeah, I just, 
Sorry, can I can I just say that I really strongly agree with Nicole, and as I mentioned earlier, we need to fight for the state and the city to fully fund education because it is not fully funded. Um, there, I'm, I, you know, we can't get all into it right now, but if you're interested in joining that fight, there are many people working. The city council, of course, is key. Um, you know, right now we have uh, extreme divestment in public education, 3K through college. CUNY is not is underfunded. My students are not able to attend school because they are not able to pay, you know, $500, $1,000 uh, bursars bills. Um, public school children are not able to go in person because a lot of schools do not have, are not being given the money in their budgets to fund the number of teachers needed. So yes, everything that Nicole is saying is true. And the more we keep trying to piece together, as you mentioned, these patchwork solutions, there will never be equity that way because it's not sustainable and it's not 100%, it's not for everyone. Those who are able to tap into that, you know, social cultural capital. So I really wanna just, yes, everything Nicole said, please get involved in the fight for full public funding of education. Yes, thank you, Nicole and Rebecca for really honing in this idea that we need a systematic and structural uh, solution to address the, all the education and equity that we're seeing, not what we are seeing during the pandemic. This is only exacerbating what we've been experiencing in the past. So kind of tying to this, I see Cheyenne chiming in saying that we need more funding for grass organizations to work in the field, which is kind of tying to our earlier conversation that we need these interpersonal co communication connections to get the work started. And this kind of ties to a question we got earlier uh, we just mentioned that the disinvestment is a huge issue that we need to address. And since now we have a parent and also a student here, I want to hear more about your take on during this election year. What are some of the issues that you think New York City candidates can address and should address that related to education? And I would like to give uh, Alexis a chance to speak first as we want to hear more from the student as well. So, um... I feel like where we like where we have like an audience, like we're able to like show like what we need to like fix within like you know the election and stuff. So I feel like where if we have an audience, then we're able to like you know bring people together in order to like have our issue come across, and then people are able to like you know fix it within the community. So bringing people together as kind of going back to the model you mentioned earlier that with the TikTok tutoring, you're also hoping that we could bring people together so they address the problem. Uh, that's also kind of tied to what Nicole was calling for the action that if you see a problem, we should come together to work on it. Nicole, do you want to chime in more on the other area in addition to funding that you want to work towards for New York City? Um, well, I love Alex's whole idea with the TikTok tutoring. I might have to use that for my own kids. <laughs> um, well, in reference to the other areas, it's just the, the resources and bringing those here. That's the only thing I would really have to chime in about. Um, like I said, my nonprofit, it brings just as a special needs community. I'm literally trying to bring more civil rights movements into our areas and education of that. We had a lot of low voter turnout over here. And I think that's because of lack of education of what our local seats um, actually do in our area, our assembly seats, our Congress seats, our city council seats. I think that that movement is very important as well, um, the education for that. And special needs awareness, That's I'm very big on that. There's so many aspects of special needs. My son, everybody says he doesn't look autistic. I don't think uh, special needs has a look, but that's just the naivety of everyone who, who doesn't understand what special education is. You don't have to have a, a wheelchair or disabilities are, you know, just to be stable. There's so many different forms. Bringing that advocacy back into our communities is very important to me. The inclusion uh, for all people, white, black, disabled, uh, or regular, I don't like that word, but they call that regular ed students, just bringing every, all those resources back here and from the ground up. Um, I'm an outreach person. COVID has really been lacked in that part. I'm, I hate virtual stuff, but this is the new world we live in. But um, 
I like to go out front, talk to people. You can really engage and they can really feel the passion that you have, you know, versus someone on the phone or, or the computer. You can't really understand or I'm an energy person. You know, you can't feel my energy that much computer, but face to face, I think I'm very convincing. So if we can even bring those back face to face and trade stuff back into our programs is very important. But I love Alex's um idea with the TikTok tutoring. I, I'm too old for TikTok. I always say that. I'm 39 years old. That's fine. But um, my kids love it. So if that's a way to get back to the community and uh, you can help other people through that, I'm going to try to, maybe I'll have my daughter chime into your TikTok and see if you can help her out because she's struggling in global <laughs> right now. <laughs> she's 15. So uh, I'll check out. It's a great asset that you're bringing for the youth. The youth is very smart. And people think that, uh, you know, you don't have to listen to kids, but sometimes they're the innovators and, it's, and we need to build them up. You know, I look into the Shiva programs a lot and they're teaching their kids financial literacy. They're teaching them life skills. And that's a life skill that Alex is doing and that we need to implement. Uh, like I said, listen to you. We get a lot of stuff and a lot of ideas from you guys. So I appreciate you, Alex, and keep on pushing. You're like the next entrepreneur. Uh, I think I was a started age as well. So just keep on being innovative and keep on having more ideas and never give up. Even if somebody thinks your idea is stupid, keep on going. You know, I have multiple businesses and I didn't know exactly what I was doing at first. But it, as long as you keep on going and implementing and, and connecting with other people, you can go real far. I was going to give you that little bit of advice. <laughs> Thank you. Did you guys? I hope you guys did. You heard me, right? Okay, good. Yes. Yes, amazing. Thank you, Nicole and Alexis. Your, I have to say that all of your energy, including Cheyenne, who was on speaker mode, really came through. It and was a screen. I can't imagine having all of us in person. Uh, how energetic the room will be. There will be more inspiration floating around in the room. So uh, I'm uh, reluctant to cut this conversation short, but. Uh, speaking of time, I want to wrap up and just highlight a few uh, points that we discussed that surfaces during the conversation. We talk about inclusion uh, to address racial equity and injustice in general. You need to give everyone uh, a seat at a table. Everyone needs to get a seat at the table to uh, address these inequity issues systematically. Uh, we also talk a lot about resources reallocation that includes financial and non-financial resources. Uh, so some of that includes nonprofit resources and community groups resources. And last but not least, we talk about funding, which is crucial. So uh, please take action by applying for our grants. Uh, vote for your uh, city council members and also other elected offices. And we will keep the conversation going. Thank you very much. And I'll have Paige come back on to wrap up the program. Thank you, Dee, and thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Alexis, and all of our panelists today. It was a great discussion, I agree with Dee. You know, I'm so excited for the time where we can come together and build together um, in person. But for now, virtually uh, and through grassroots uh, vehicles is, is, is um, our way forward. Uh, so this broadcast was brought to you by TD Bank. They are our sponsor. We want to thank everyone for joining us today and especially TD uh, Bank uh, for sponsoring today's broadcast. Again, just want to remind folks that starting today, we're launching our The New Yorkers for New York fundraising campaign. Uh, so every gift received will be matched one to one up to $150,000. All you have to do is click on that QR code that you see on the screen or go to citizensnyc.org slash New Yorkers to get full access to our brand new site and find out how you can donate. Thank you so much for joining us today and have a lovely rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Take care. Well, whether you have roots in New York City or whether you come into New York City by choice, it's a place that's a beacon. It's a place where you challenge yourself. It's a place of so much culture that it's, you're drawn to it. You will come back and be built a little bit like the Phoenix. It will rise from its ashes. Mm -hmm. and it'll give New York a certain chance to, to I won't say start over, but uh, to recreate itself as an even better place. I, I love that. I say that a lot and you know, you sometimes get looks from people, but I have to believe that that's what's going to happen, that, you know, New York will become something else. When Citizens was founded, New York City was mired in one of the worst financial crises in its history. And that now famous advertisement that our founder, Oz Elliott, placed in the New York Times 
produced over 10,000 caring neighbors. Everyone pitched in as city services were slashed, and that's the proud beginning of this organization. Today, we're in the midst of crisis, and we need to step up. And we've seen it before, that when average, everyday New Yorkers come together, they can make amazing things happen. They can create places that have been left behind. They can bring them forward. 40 years ago, New York City was on the verge of bankruptcy. The New York Times writing about that period not long ago said that the difference between solvency and insolvency was paper thin. New York is very different today, arguably the most diverse and interesting city in the world. We don't claim credit for that transformation, but we do proudly claim credit for being there in 1975 when things were so difficult for the city. New Yorkers are the, the toughest people in the world. So when I hear folks say that New York is dead, New York is over, cities persist, and New York is the greatest city in the world. So that is not the truth. New York City is said to be a metropolis forever chasing progress and perfection, but it is lately best at making do with the reality of considerably less. All In for New York City says it all. We are going to do everything that we can to make sure that the greatest city in the world always wins and continues to win and that everybody gets to celebrate in that victory.